Welcome to Black Onyx, where we hope to keep you better informed. We're discussing the regulatory topic, TCF, treating customers fairly. With me today is Johan van Sale from Outsource Compliance Services. Johan, thank you for joining us today. Andrew, thank you for having me. What is the difference between principle and rules-based regulation? Andrew, let's start with the rules-based. So rules-based regulation is essentially where a regulator sets rules for that a company must abide to. Um, these rules are typically um, yes, yes or no, require yes or no answers, and corporations then typically also apply a tick box approach to complying to them. Um, especially in my experience, um, you, can see, you can see that sometimes corporations do tend to find loopholes um, in order to to do not well, essentially not comply with these with these regulations. Um, however, some of them also do uh, tend to sail very close to the wind, so they do just what is necessary in order to be compliant. Um, sometimes, actually, to the detriment uh, of their clients. Let's chat about um, principle-based regulation. So, principle-based regulation takes rules-based actually to a, a step up. Um, essentially, what this means is that let's actually let's go through two scenarios. Um, a corporation must have certain policies in place, a business continuity plan for instance. You either have the policy in place or you don't have the policy in place. Um, that is essentially rules based. If we look at principle based, a key individual not only must they um, comply with rules based regulation, but in certain instances they must also comply to codes of conduct, codes of best practice. As a key individual, you need to demonstrate that you are fit and proper. How do you do that? Um, the, it's the answers are normally subjective in nature, demanding further evidence to be provided by a said key individual in order, in order to comply or deem to be compliant um, with a said principle. The point I want to make is that rules-based compliance typically requires a yes or no response, where principle-based entails on a scale of 1 to 10, how do you, do you believe you comply and demonstrate how you comply? What comes to mind when I say treating customers fairly? Well, I think the first thing that I want to say on this question is that if you don't treat your customers fairly, you don't deserve to have any customers. But um, it's, it's self-regulatory, or it should be. Um, in essence though, customer satisfaction, definitely, and whether your service or product meet or exceeds the customer's expectations, very important. What are the six TCF outcomes? And can you give us a brief overview of each? Outcome one, the culture outcome. Um, ask the question to companies whether they have adopted a culture within their business that, um, that provides for companies to comply constantly with the corporate, uh, with good corporate governance. Um, essentially, what, what this entails is that the board of directors need to remain or need to demonstrate that they have adopted a good corporate governance at board level. If they haven't done this, uh, the chances are very likely that, and history also shows us that employees, if there's no leader at the top of, the, of a corporation, that they won't follow suit at the bottom. Let's ask a couple of questions. Section two of the General Code of Conduct for Financial Service Providers states that an FSP must act with due skill um, in relation to the rendering of financial services. How does your company comply with this requirement? How do you demonstrate that you've acted in within the client's best interests um, and who's responsible for ensuring that the client receives uh, a good product that, um, that, must them, that meets their needs, etc. So additional questions that, we, that, that will get you thinking is that how do you, in terms of your risk management plan, how do you ensure that your interests of your clients are aligned with that of the board? Um, do they, is, it, is the board purely just out there to, to make money or are they going to put their clients first? Further than that, how, do you, how does the board demonstrate that the staff, that their staff is aware of the TCF policy with, adopted within the business, obviously with the, at, the, at board level? Um, how do you demonstrate that your business shows good corporate governance. Outcome two, products and services marketed and sold uh, to a selected group of clients 
Um, how do you, most obviously those products must meet the needs of the clients and also how do you target them? Um, the questions we need to ask ourselves and to demonstrate that you comply with this is, do we know our clients? Do we know what our clients' needs are? Obviously, if you're going to market and market and sell a product, you need to know what your clients want. Do we also conduct a due diligence on the products that we offer? Do we find out what these products comprise of, um, who underwrites them, who's, who are we contracting with as a financial service provider in, in, in that type of setup? Um, also, do we do a full financial needs analysis or a suitability analysis as required in terms of Section 8 of the Fair General Code of Conduct? Uh, before rendering, obviously before rendering any advice, we need to do a suitability analysis to see whether the product, um, the needs of the product or the needs of the individual matches what the product offers them um, and take it from there. Ultimately, um, how do you, do you know really what your client wants? Obviously, if you're going to design a product that meets their needs, you need to do have done some type of research and then that research demonstrates the compliance to outcome two. Like not all products will meet the needs of your clients. However, as advisors, you do need to do a suitability analysis in terms of Section 8 um, to obviously recommend the best product for that meets the needs for, for a client. And it's your responsibility to ensure that that product s does what it says it does uh, at the end of the day. So outcome three, the information outcome, is essentially customers need to be kept appropriately, in, appropriately informed. The information must be clear um, before, during, and after contracting with a financial advisor or financial advisory business. How do we demonstrate that the, the information that you've provided to your client um, complies with outcome three? Well, it, it's quite easy. The information needs to be in clear, plain language. Um, it must be in language that they understand. The information that you provide to your client must not misrepresent the facts. You must also ensure that um, if you're going to offer a certain product by via a product supplier, you need to provide all that product supplier's details and the details comprising the product to the client so that they know what the product is about that you have advised them on. As an advisor, you need to disclose all the material information to your client for them to make an informed decision at the end of the day. So outcome four relates to advice. Obviously, where you render advice, the advice needs to be suitable and must meet the needs of your client. In terms of Section 8 of the General Code of Conduct, we are all very aware that where you render advice, you need to conduct a suitability analysis. So how do you demonstrate to the regulator or the authority that you've done a suitability analysis, your full financial needs analysis that the advisors or their compliance officers call it? How do you keep track of it? Um, who signs it off? Who, who makes sure that the advice that you've, that you've given is then recorded um, in terms of your replacement policy and also your record of advice policy? Who checks the needs of the client with the recommendations that you've made? Are you, as the advisor, only providing advice to fulfill your own benefit. For instance, you're getting preferential um, rates or commission by advising a certain product. Does your record advice make all the necessary disclosures in terms of general code of conduct? You must check with your compliance officer, let them review your record of advice. Do you consider all the requirements in terms of the replacement policy? Or additional questions that we need to ask, especially the, the, the corporations and the FSPs, is if you, dis if you discover um, that your advisors are mis-selling products to clients, what would you do in that instance? How would you go about it? How would you, how do you rectify the mis-selling of a, of a certain product to a, to a customer? How do you ensure that your advisors are kept up to date with all the changes, um, legislative changes, product changes, um, et cetera, et cetera? So outcome five, the delivery outcome. Basically, customers need to know that the product that you've sold them is what they expect. So the product that the company sold you, it needs to make sure or meet your standard that you're expecting from the product. So in a scenario, how does a company or financial service provider make sure that the product still remains 
and meets the expect or exceeds the client's expectations. How do you, as the as a financial service provider, um, ensure that the performance, let's say a, a performance of your fund or performance of a long-term insurance policy, um, remains and does what it says it needs to do? Um, have you got systems and controls in place? Do you maybe send out a, a consumer survey uh, to all your clients to say, listen, are you still happy with the product? Do you review your, your, the, the products that you've sold um, to your client? Outcome six, the post-sale treatment. So you've now sold everything, clients are happy. However, a couple of years down the line, they now um, would like to make, well, the, the performance of the product is not doing what it says it, said it, said it does, and they would like to formally complain. Um, how do you manage that? How do you manage um, the, the barriers to, for a client to complain about a certain service or the advice or the product that you've advised them? Um, what procedures do you have in place as an advisory business? Do you have a formal com complaint procedure in place that, that's followed? Who's responsible for dealing all with, the, with the complaints that you receive? Does your, co your complaint policy also require a bit more information about the complaint so you can identify what's wrong within your business or within the product so you can divulge that information to perhaps your product supplier um, so that they can rectify the problem? And also, how do you reimburse um, the client. Obviously, if the client um, takes it further to the ombud, there may be negative reputational repercussions for, for you as advisor and also your, your FSP. Should a financial services business have a TCF policy? Andrew, most definitely. Each company within South Africa needs to have a, some sort of TCF policy in, in place. Um, it'll demonstrate good corporate governance on a, on a board level and it'll filter, it, at the end of the day it'll filter through to your employees. And especially in today's times, you, we can see that customers, consumers, they want to see corporations that are applying good corporate governance within the business. And um, especially with, with social media these days, you make one wrong decision, it'll be, it'll be blown up and your reputation, even though you haven't done anything wrong, or the corporation hasn't done anything wrong, um, the, 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 the social responsibility and those non-written rules seem to dominate um, from, a, from a, a legal and also from a reputational point of view. As I mentioned earlier in this interview, Andrew, you don't deserve to have customers if you don't treat them fairly. So, in my opinion, it should be self-regulatory. How does an FSP ensure that TCF is applied holistically? Okay, so, um, this, this question also relates to outcome one, the culture question. So if a board of directors are reluctant to adopt a TCF policy or framework within the organization, um, you'll, you'll see that you need to set the example from above. Your employees will suffer and also um, there will be rep possible rep reputational repercussions at a later stage. Um, how do you ensure that um, TCF is, is applied through your business? Well, it's very difficult. It's not something that, that as, an, as an outsider, we, we, it's, it's not, not rules-based regulations, as I've mentioned earlier. These are principles that you have to abide by. The King Code, for instance. Um, so these, are, these things are sometimes voluntary, but it's in the, it's in the company's and the director's best interests to abide by them, um, especially in, in taking con into consideration today's times. In your opinion, Johan, which TCF principle is the most important and why? Andrew, to be honest with you, all TCF principles are very important, equally important as such, uh, within the context of your business. Obviously, if you're not going to render advice then, or you're not licensed for, for advice, um, then that principle or that outcome isn't, isn't relevant. Um, however, I think if I were to prioritise these outcomes, I would suggest that Outcome number one, well, number one, the culture outcome is pretty much the, the most important one because if, if you don't have the board and the board doesn't buy in, then you're going to struggle, uh, really. So if the employees say, listen, yes, we would love to adopt a TCF approach to, to, com to compliance and we would love to, to do X, Y and Z, but the board doesn't buy in, then you, you, you're stuck in a rut. You're just not going to, to accomplish anything. And um, that's, that's my opinion on that one. How do the six TCF outcomes tie in with the FSCA and Twin Peaks? Okay, so 
as we all know that from the 1st of April, the FSB, the Financial Services Board, changed to the Financial Sector Conduct Authority under the Twin Peaks regulation. So our market conduct regulator, now the FSCA, their vision is to ensure that there is an efficient financial uh, market system within, the, within our industry as well as the fair treatment of customers. So essentially what we can expect in future is the FSCA is going to adopt more print the TCF print or outcomes uh, to base their regulation on. And I think uh, it, at the moment it's, it's, very, it's very much a combination of both um, and I can see going forward the princi principle based will be increasing. Who is ultimately responsible for TCF within the business? The crux of it is, Andrew, that TCF should be embraced within every organisation, not only on board level, but um, it needs to filter down through to everybody. But ultimately, the buck stops with the directors of each company. They are responsible for the management of the company. So if a client has a bad experience um, in with, an ad with a financial advisor, Obviously, the, the financial advisor needs to be made aware that the client is unhappy with his or her, um, with the circumstances or the level of service or the product that they've received. And this needs to go, the feedback needs to be provided, the clear communication channels need to be set in, set pla in place uh, between the advisor and management and obviously ultimately the directors. They need to know how they can employ their skills to make sure that the business is profitable and re the relevant, relevant re risks involved are all mitigated. What controls should an FSP have in place to ensure that customers are treated fairly? Okay, so my recommendation on, on answering this question would be um, sending out perhaps an annual survey or biannual survey to, to the clients that you've already done business with. I know that the advisors, um, they go see their clients maybe every six months, but also ask them, listen, are you happy with the current level of service that we're delivering to you? Are you happy with the product? Is, it, is the product performing as it should be? Um, do you have any other recommendations that you might want to make to us? Uh, what about the product offering? Do you, have you seen perhaps a product in the market that may ne meet your needs that we don't offer? If yes, we would like to know about it. So effectively, it's, yeah, it's keeping your customers happy, keeping your clients uh, long term, not just for a quick sale and a, and a buck there. Essentially, you need to lead by example. And remember, you're in it for the long term. That's, that's very important. You're not there to quickly sell, sell a policy and say bye-bye. Um, it's, it's, you're there for the next 10 to 15 years with the, with the client, at the minute, very minimum. Johan, thank you for your time and, and sharing your knowledge on this compliance topic. Andrew, thanks for the opportunity and I uh, hope to see you soon. And thank you for tuning in to Black Onyx. For more details, please visit our website.